So we're going to start off with a discussion um, and then uh, open it up to the whole uh, audience. And, and as Heather mentioned, the, the chat is where people can share their questions. Um, and it's my privilege to introduce to you um, Gisela Fosado and Ken Whistaker. Gisela is the editorial director at Duke University Press and publishes books in a wide range of areas in the humanities and social sciences, including anthropology, sociology, history, gender and sexuality studies, race and ethnicity, environmental studies, and Latin American and Latinx studies. Um, Gisela has worked with authors, including Patricia Hill Collins, Renato Rosaldo, Arturo Escobar, Marisol de la Cadena, um, Marcia Chatelain, and Charles E. Cobb Jr. She's originally from Mexico and was the first in her family to go to college. And after earning her PhD in cultural anthropology, she pursued an alt-ac career path in documentary film festival work and feminist event programming. And it is our good luck that she moved into book publishing at Duke about 10 years ago and was recently named the editorial director. Ken Whistaker is the senior executive editor at the press and has um, acquired books across the humanities, social sciences and the arts. His book work began with assembling book displays at the seminary co-op bookstore at the University of Chicago. Um, and he's recalled watching how um, uh, new work would ignite conversations and travel across fields. And I think that that's actually something that the press um, can sort of claim as part of its uh, stamp. It's the way that um, uh, so many books have bridged fields. And he joined the press as an acquisitions editor in 1991 and has just come off of 15 years as editorial director and assumed his current position earlier this year. In addition to his duties at the press, he serves as director of intellectual publics at the Grad Center at CUNY in New York City. And he has published more than a thousand books with authors including Stuart Hall, Donna Haraway, Sheila Mbembe, Lisa Lowe, and Jose Munoz. He speaks regularly on publishing at universities in the US and around the world. And we are so grateful to both Gisela and Ken for making the time to share their experience and um, counsel with us. With that, I'll invite our speakers to take the floor. Thank you so much, Zizi. And thank you, Arnetta and Sylvia and Paulo and uh, all of you for coming and uh, making the time to be here. Uh, Gisela and I are going to go back and forth uh, speaking. So it uh, is less like a talk and more like a conversation. And I just want to start out on an upbeat note. Um, this is a precarious time for lots of reasons. I don't have to tell you. It's a pandemic. There's a bad job market. There's university funding issues. There's an election. Um, but it's actually a really good time to be writing and publishing. And uh, that kind of is counterintuitive, but as somebody who's been at the press for a long time, I feel like the way books get out and people are reading them, not because they need them for like their exams or for some disciplinary reason, but because people need things for their life and they're reading them in a, a kind of genuine way has really kind of changed what publishing could be and what people could do in their own work. And I think it's a gift you can't take lightly. Lightly, There are lots of times where just getting someone down the hall from you to pay attention to what you're doing could seem like a big task. So the kinds of uh, possibilities for readership we have now is a real gift. And I think social media has made a huge, huge difference in that. Um, it used to be people would go to like an annual conference and then they'd like go, oh, when did this book come out? And it'd be like eight months ago. Whereas now, like yesterday, my colleague Josh Trannon posted that uh, one of uh, their, his authors had received a contract, actually the author post, posted it, and 442 people had liked it in 24 hours. So before it's actually even a book, you see people posting their covers, you see people posting their page proofs, so the kind of 
knowledge that people have that things are out and that they could be important. And we saw that last year. We did a book by Tiffany, Tiffany Lethbo King called The Black Shoals. And there was so much conversation before the book had made it really anywhere. And uh, I can remember that starting with Christina Sharps uh, in the wake, you know, three months after the book is out at the Whitney Biennale, there's already a huge artwork named by somebody who had inspired, had been inspired by Christina's book. That's not always been the case, but it should be really empowering. It means you could write what you need to say and that there'd be people there to read it. And one of the things that's come with it is there's been a kind of uh, opening to methodological and writerly forms that we also wouldn't have seen before. Because if you think you're writing for all the people who might be interested, that gives you a lot more ways to write. So I think of it as a moment of really unusual possibility. And part of what we want to do today is to like guide you through like the basic parts, but also feel, you should leave feeling empowered that you could write more of the book you want to write and that there be people able to hear it. So I'm going to turn it over to Hesela and she's going to talk about uh, finding the right press and how to think about that. Like Ken, I just want to thank all the organizers and thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, and I want to start off by saying that we can't do what we do without you. And that should always influence the way you think about university presses. We're part of the academic ecosystem and we are here to publish the work of scholars. And so I know sometimes scholars, especially junior scholars feel a little bit intimidated thinking, oh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna contact a press yet, you know, but really you, we are here, we can't do our job without connecting with you. And there are quite a few ways that we try to connect with authors and, um, and, and so please don't be shy. You know, this is part of what you need to do. And we're also here to try to connect with you. Um, and one of the things you'll want to think about is what is the right press? Where do you even start? You know, there's more than 100 university presses. Like, how do you even think about how to go about that? And one thing that I definitely would not suggest is to just do a blanket letter uh, of submission or, you know, to introduction to all of those presses. There are a lot of differences um, in, in presses and there, and not every press is really going to be right for your project. Uh, presses tend to specialize and um, there are some presses that are the leading presses in African studies or other presses are the leading presses in sociology or anthropology and they're not all going to be the same. So, um, and this is something that Will be maybe Tsitsi can speak about later that really tenure committees look at what press you publish with. So it's not just a decision that you need to make um, without consulting anyone. And actually that's one of the key threads that I wanna touch on throughout this whole presentation. Do not do this alone. You need a team, you need a network and a lot of people are gonna be uh, able to guide you. And so you, you know, you really want to start thinking about what, what are the top presses in the field, talk to your chair and mentors when, you know, if you have a tenure track job and figure out what are the presses that are going to be really taken seriously for tenure. Um, and once, and another way to, to really approach that, that you don't even have to talk to anyone to figure out which presses are going to really be ideal for you is you start looking at your bookshelf, you start looking at your bibliography, and you're going to start, I mean, maybe you're, maybe, I don't know, when I was a graduate student, I wasn't paying tons of attention to the presses that published the books that I was citing, but um, hopefully you're doing that more than I did, but um Right there, you're gonna see all of the presses that are in conversation, that, that are publishing work that's in conversation with your book. And those presses are the ones that know how to find the readers for your book. You know, Duke Press um, specializes in a, quite a range of things, including interdisciplinary approaches, queer studies, black studies, Latinx studies. And so we know how to reach those audiences. We go to all of the conferences that are relevant for our books. 
and all of that. And we also know we, we have expertise all along the way on how to really make those books successful. Um, I've done so many books in Latin American studies. I know, um, I know the field really well. I know, you know, I, I can help guide in terms of quite a few things. And I know who, um, I've, I've worked with a lot of reviewers who, and I know what kinds of reviews they submit. So there's a lot of knowledge that editors acquire about a particular field over time. And so there's multiple reasons why um, you don't really want to just publish with any press. You want to try to find the, the press that's going to really be best for you. And also what acquisitions edit, you know, we're all people um, and you, you want to um, really work with some, you know, this is going to be a multi-year relationship that you will form with an editor. Um, and it's a relationship that is a key one for for your team for your book publication team because you know we're here to be to offer support to offer guidance we're going to be sharing the anonymous peer reviews like you you're going to want to feel comfortable um and feel like you can ask questions to your editor so you know that's one of the other things that finding a right press um is is really part part of the process is finding the right editor at the right press all right, I'll turn it back over to you, Ken. Thank, thank you, Hisela, that was really helpful. Um, one of the things that I find myself more and more thinking about as I've done this for a while is about genre and writing and really the difference between a dissertation and often the first book which has come out of that dissertation, even when the topic and the focus is the same. And it's really about comes to me from thinking about like, what are the material conditions of a dissertation in the first place? You make a proposal, you go out, people have approved the proposal. They've agreed to read the dissertation before you've even written it. Um, and to me, the most important thing is you can write it assuming they're going to read to the end. So in a way, in a dissertation, more is more. The more you show that you've done the research, the more impressed they're going to be the more it looks like you've taken what was a good idea and really kind of expanded it. Um, of course, you're also writing for a particular committee. So if you have a committee at Duke and you think like, who would have been on my committee if I had done this at Columbia or I had done this at Berkeley, then you could think like, oh, hmm, how would it have been pushed to be a different way? Who would I have to have cited differently or what might I have had to thought of, think about differently? I think the, the idea that you're writing for someone reading to the end is really the kind of um, toughest, toughest thing to get around. Because in a book, nobody has to read it at all. And you have to kind of motivate people to read it. Lots of topics for dissertations start with filling in a niche. You could be an art historian and be like, oh, here's this uh, Iberian altarpiece. No one's written on it yet. Wouldn't it be great to have a monograph on it? Or you could be an anthropologist and find a place that a kind of site to do ethnography that people on your committee think could be productive. And you're sort of filling in kind of a positivist mapping of knowledge. When it comes to books, those aren't really the books we mostly read. We keep up with our field, but really we look for books that are going to excite us, that are gonna help us with our own work, that are going to make us think differently. So in a lot of times you have to get from what was the work that you did to compile the research to what's my argument? What am I really trying to convince somebody of? And getting that argument, getting that narrative story, getting the purpose that you can take all the footage, which is really like all the research you did, if it were a film, it's the footage, and giving that footage a kind of pacing and rhythm and order. So somebody starts the book and they get pulled into it they see what the payoff's going to be and they wanna keep reading. That's actually the biggest task. And that's the kind of hardest part. And as Hisela says, it's not really something that can be done alone. And it can't be done alone because you need the feedback of somebody going like, uh, you lost me here. What were you trying to say? Uh, most of us come out of grad school uh, with kind of shorthand from our cohort of like, you know, little things we picked up from professors. 
What if somebody was reading it who didn't share that shorthand? What if people didn't know all the kind of quotes you were using? So you have to think about how you explain it in a much more open way. Um, <clears throat> I was told by uh, somebody who had done their dissertation with Andrew Ross at uh, NYU that he gave them a list of words they can't use. So it's like, oh, instead of neoliberalism or uh, homonormativity, like if you're forced to explain what you mean, then you have to think, well, what do I actually mean by neoliberalism here? Which is often really what your, where your argument comes. So trying to like figure out what the argument is and then replot the book out of the dissertation around that argument. It, this could be a narrative history. You could replot it around a narrative and an argument, but you have to replot it and see which are the parts that go on the cutting room floor and which are the parts that a reader needs to read. If there were three examples to back up your argument in the dissertation, would a reader just be convinced by one in the book? Probably. So how do you get the kind of pacing and tightness that will make people want to, want to read the book? You have to take interdisciplinary ser interdisciplinarity seriously. So if you're an anthropologist and you want your book to be read by historians, you better go present it to a few historians so they can say like, mm -mm, that's not an archive or no, you didn't cite this. You need to find out what you need to do to read the different audiences you want to read it. Um, and then finally, and I'm sorry to run through all these things so quickly, but I'm trying to keep us on time. You have to think about voice. So a lot of times as a grad student, and I think that's um, gendered and raced, you know, we're encouraged to cite other people. You think like if you put the argument in terms of what like other people have argued as John Jackson has shown, you know, then you get as Mark Anthony Neal argued, then you can kind of only put in your own little addition. We might consider at the end. In a book, nobody wants to read an account of like what other people said. They've already read those books or they should have. So like where it says, as Fred Moten argues, and there's a paragraph, what's that doing in your book? What do you wanna say there? What can you say in your own words? And developing the voice kind of that is your own narrator is really a challenge. And I have a nice story. Um, there's a book I did a few years ago called Shapeshifters. Maybe some of you read it by Amy Cox, who was an anthropologist. She did her PhD at Michigan. Um, and as uh, it was about black girls in Detroit and as a black woman anthropologist, I think like, you know, will this count as anthropology writing about these black girls at a time when that was not necessarily a common anthropological uh, subject? Um, you know, the, all the kind of questions people have about their own writing, their own worth, their own tenure, you know, and then the book comes out and it was a, it's a great book. And I was at an academic meeting and a woman comes over and she's looking through the book. And I'm like, that's a great book. It had only been out like a few months. And she's like, I know, I teach at Spelman. And she came down here to give a talk and I had to get all fangirl over her because I used <laughs> it in my work. And I was like, thought, well, here's a book that was just kind of like, is this going to be okay at one moment? But you're already writing for the next generation. You're really writing for the grad students who are gonna come after you. You're gonna write for the people who are gonna get all fangirl over you. So you have to be more, less writing for big judgy people who you may never please anyway in your field and think much more about what are you conveying down? What are you conveying to the net, the people who are gonna follow you and get all fangirl over you? How are they gonna quote you? And when you say like, when they say, as you argue, when they're quoting you in their work, what's that going to be? And then build your book from there. So that's, that's a little advice for thinking about that. And I'm gonna turn it back to Hesela. Yeah, and just to add on that a little bit, um, I think that is one of the key roles. Sometimes people ask me, what is the role of an acquisitions editor? What do you all actually do? And this 
really is part of it. You know, we see so many proposals. We talk to a lot of authors who are talking about their projects and there's a lot of things we see. And, um, and so, you know, pushing people to really develop their voice and, de and, and make their own claims. We, you know, that's one of the things we do is keep trying to push the claims. It's not just that you're trying to fill a hole in this little literature. That's not, you know, that's not what we're trying to push you to do. We want, we want you to, you know, and, and part of that really is stepping away from your work because it's so hard. The dissertation really is a completely different type of project and you need to step away and figure out what is that major takeaway that's gonna help shake up a field or, you know, help the people think of things a different way. It might be, expanding an argument, it might be telling a story um, a different way. Um, I just had a conversation with a second author, a book in, who I had worked with him on his first book and it was really a story driven book and has been taught widely. And he just came to me with a second book and was like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do half of each chapter will be the story and half of it's gonna be the analysis and I'll just keep doing it. And I was like, no, you know? So there's certain things that because we've seen people, we've seen some things really work. And then, you know, once I suggested this, he was like, oh, I think you're right. You know, and it, it's just so interesting. So it's like, it's not even just the first time authors, you know, sometimes just talking to somebody about what you're trying to do and getting that feedback from somebody who also thinks about the shape of books um, can be really helpful. And that's one of the things that we try to do as acquisition editors. And um, I wanted to, in this vein, also talk about some of the things we hear authors um, start to kind of get tied to. Um, there was a time, and I feel like it's sort of passed a little bit, where a lot of authors wanted everything multimedia. I think it's because, you know, there was Ebooks um, were really starting to be more widely adopted, and they were like, "I want people to be able to link out to this and to that." And, and um, you know, there's all kinds of bells and whistles that you could think about, but you know, we I, I don't know as as editors, we really want the book to be successful in its intervention or in its story, and sometimes those. Uh, multimedia or other things that people really um, start to get tied to aren't actually focusing on developing the story and, their, and, and the intervention and aren't really going to make the book um, taught in the ways that, that it would be otherwise without a focus so much on those things. So um, there's, uh, I've also had authors who, yeah, sometimes they pitch a book. I, I've had one author pitch a book in reverse chronology and again, it was like trying to make their book different and stand out in a way that um, just didn't really make sense because the point of the book was to tell a story. And you know, by trying to do something different in form, sometimes that does make sense. Sometimes it really does make the book stand out. But um, anyway, it's something. It's one of those areas that editor, that acquisitions editors love talking about form and about structure with with authors um, as they develop their work. Um, a question that always comes up too is um, color images, and I just thought I would touch on that super briefly. Um, color images are one of those things that remain expensive for book publishing and unless your book really is an art history book or there's a, a real compelling reason why your argument um, or story can really only be told through color images, um, you know, or if you can raise the money, um, it's something that you'll want to be thinking carefully about. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Ken. So um, one of the things that we haven't talked a lot about is a review process. And uh, everything to give somebody a contract for their book, we have to review the manuscript or review something. Uh, if this were um, somebody who had done uh, 15 books, you know, uh, Ray Chow at Duke uh, was an, is an example I often use, people will be like very quick to say, oh, that book will be successful. And they probably also don't need that much advice. Um, most of us need a lot of advice, and most of the people who are peer reviewers 
uh, want enough to actually be able to be helpful and useful. Uh, we look for two reviewers. It's single blind, which means they'll know who the author is, but you won't know who the reviewer is. Um, and uh, every press kind of does this a little differently. So it's a very good topic to ask your editor about. Um, and uh, you send it out to two reviewers normally if the reviews are mostly positive, uh, then we can, well, you'd ask the author to write a response and could request a contract based on that. I myself look for reviewers who, um, and this is sort of a funny old way of putting it, but if you called them up on the phone and told them about the project, they'd go, wow, that sounds really cool. That sounds exciting. But then they'd be honest about what they actually were reading and whether it lived up to what it could be or not but in a supportive way that could help the author get there. So I think of it not like a kind of gatekeeping thing, but more like a real part of the process where you get the kind of intensive feedback that's partly for us, so it makes it a little more dispassionate and helpful sometimes uh, that can really make it better. Like I sometimes compare it to the test screening for a film, except there are only two people in the audience watching but then like what worked and what didn't, where they got lost, where it was, where it was helpful. And that uh, kind of brings us around to like the topic we were gonna talk about next, uh, which was uh, review pro was um, proposals. Um, and I'm sure Hosella will have more to say about the review process, but uh, in terms of proposals, uh, they're a kind of um, instrumental thing and what their main purpose is, is to interest an editor. You can, another purpose is to organize your own thoughts. And, uh, but I think that a lot of the um, push to have a proposal as the first thing that you do when you're like revising your dissertation has been oversold. I once asked the professor who's in about this and she said, well, I just want people to do something that felt useful. And I was like, well, if I get a proposal, then I'm going to say, wow, that looks really exciting. I'd love to send this out to readers. What do you have? And if the person goes like, well, I've got my dissertation and I've got a chapter I revised for an article. I'd be like, oh, okay. Because I won't want to send that to readers. I'd be like, well, get in touch when you like have the manuscript ready so we can send it out. And so it'll be like a year and a half later. So I've started to compare it to like putting a profile up on a dating site. And then if somebody's interested going like, well, I'm not actually dating, you know, till next year, but thank you for appreciating this. Um, so trying to like think about the proposal as connected to the actual um, manuscript rather than something you waste a lot of time on ahead of time. Because I think a lot of people who really should be in the stuff of their manuscript and thinking how that will work are instead like thinking a lot about like, oh, what's the competition or what's my market or other things that to be honest, presses shouldn't really be asking about in the first place. This is something where Hassel and I have uh, different points of view. So I'm gonna turn it back to her and uh, she can share her own feeling. Yeah, I don't think our points of view are that different, but I do think that it is, it doesn't do any good when people are writing proposals based on a dissertation, because what needs to happen, and this is one of the times people always ask me, well, when's the perfect time to contact an acquisition editor? And there's no, there, people contact us at all kinds of stages, but I think that one, you know, if you still are in the dissertation phase and you're not sure what that main takeaway and the main argument or main story is, it's probably a little too early. But once you have that, then um, I think it's a good time to contact an acquisition editor. And I think that there are many presses that really insist on proposals as a starting point. And so at that point, you might... Um, you might write one up. That said, like Ken, I meet with people at conferences and when I can sense, oh my gosh, this project, I can see exactly how this is making an intervention in the field, how this is gonna be taught. 
I also say skip the proposal, just <laughs> finish the manuscript. I want to send it that right away. Um, so I think there are um, different approaches um, to, to proposals. Uh, and I guess in terms of the review process, I'll just say that we, we also approach it differently than other presses. Sometimes presses really want a thumbs up, thumbs down uh, from reviewers. And that is absolutely not the approach that the Duke Press takes. We are trying to make the books, each of them, be the best possible version of themselves. And we want the review process to push the author to make revisions that are going to um, to make the book successful and ideally become a classic and be taught for many, many years. Um, and the reviews are off. I mean, sometimes it just, it's, I'm just overblown by, or, or I'm blown away by how much reviewers put into these reviews. I mean, 10, 15, 20 pages of just like single spaced, you know, really trying to help push authors on the overall project on, you know, on the chapter level. I know Tsitsi, who's on our board, sees a lot of the review process and it's just incredible. And it's incredible the kind of work that some scholars do to really help other scholars um, shape their work. And it, so if you, I think the way I see it is that reviews are a gift. They are a gift, <laughs> you know, it's, I, you know, I won't say that every single review is, is like that, but most of them that I see are, and they're all written with, um, with the only hope of making the book better. So, you know, when authors engage with that process and take time to reflect and really think, okay, this person is telling me this, I hadn't originally thought of that. What can I take from that? That will really help me with my vision of the book. And, you know, sometimes the reviewers are wrong. Sometimes they are really stuck on an approach that, you know, they would have really wanted to write that book and they would have written in a different way. And, um, and that is another part of the role of an acquisitions editor. We want to help guide you through that and talk to you. And, you know, as long as you can really articulate why a review doesn't make sense and, you know, we'll ask you to respond to the reviews and, we welcome pushback because um, not, yeah, not everyone w will take the same approach. And, um, but it really, overall, I just think that the review process is like the biggest gift ever given to, to scholars who are on the tenure track. Could I break in here and suggest that we might open the conversation um, now to some of the questions. Thank you both so much for um, sharing uh, your perspectives. I think one of the things that really comes through is how much um, books are one way of making a relationship between our ideas in rooms and um, readers who will then take them up. And so much of what you've both been saying is about you guys are part of like that conversation, not just in terms of connecting us, but also in helping us to think about what do we really want to say and how do we want to be heard. And um, I asked both um, Hisela and Ken to tell me a tiny bit about their journey into publishing, um, which is something that even though I've had the privilege of working with you both, um, uh, I wouldn't necessarily know. And it's because one of the wonderful things working on the press board is to get to understand just how much of an investment editors make in their authors and care about them and their ideas too. So it's easy from the other side of this to feel like um, there's a kind of power differential and to be very intimidated by reaching out to editors. But um, I think so much of what you've shared with us really is about the work that you do in opening channels. Um, so I actually wanted to um, kind of collate a question that a number of people have been asking in different ways, which is um, how do you start that conversation? How do you begin that relationship? Um, some folks are asking that in terms of um, uh, how long a proposal should be and at what stage and that sort of thing, but also what kinds of things um, you're interested in, in um, those initial reviews, but I think the, the the question behind that is really how do you start the conversation? Um, I, I guess I'll start by saying that every single press, because we do want to connect with scholars, every single press on their website 
has instructions and clear ways to contact or to submit proposals. And so that is, you know, the number one way you should, you should um, think about approaching an editor is by looking at the website and seeing how um, they, they would like to receive proposals. Editors also, and this is hard now with COVID because, you know, one of the things we do is we go all across the country to, to conferences. And that is another key way that we try to meet potential authors. And during those conferences, we have back-to-back -back meetings with potential authors. Um, and sometimes it's people who we've reached out to and we've seen in the program and we've, it, their project looks exciting or we've heard about their work and, um, and, and we wanna connect with them. Sometimes it's authors who contact us and tell us a little bit about their work and ask if, if we have time to meet. So um, those are two of the ways. Ken, did you wanna say a little more? No, oh, I was just gonna say there's, it's never really too early uh, there are people I met when they were grad students who I ended up publishing their book a number of years later um, because it's just a conversation. I go to the Fords every year and they have like those little 15 minute sit down with the editors things. And there are people I met there, a bunch of them who I ended up publishing, even though in 15 minutes you can just have the barest start of a conversation. So I would feel like empowered to meet people and not worried about it because you're it's part of making the network that's going to stay with you throughout your academic and writerly life. Uh, so even if you meet with an editor and you're like, mm, that's not the person for me, they, I don't think they really get it. It's still a connection you could use later. Um, you definitely don't need someone to introduce you. It's not an old boy network system. There's some disciplines where vestiges of that remain, but I think in the areas that we publish in, that's not at all useful. No one needs to write for you. And I think the main thing is to get your interesting ideas up front, you know, and that's true of every form of communication. Don't start a cover letter with a long quote from Judith Butler, you know, start with your idea. And the, um, th so, just trying to get somebody who like Cathex on it and is interested, I think goes, goes the furthest. And it really doesn't matter where people are. Like the whole, uh, we go through proposals every week in my office uh, with the two assistant editors I work with. And we pay the least attention to where is the person located. That doesn't matter at all. It's really about the ideas, about the writing. And so, you know, value yourself, take yourself seriously and get it out there in a form where people could recognize that. Thank you. Um, another question that's come up in a couple uh, of these is to do with embargoes um, on dissertations and whether you need to worry about things that are already available and then also any kinds of um, questions, uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, any kinds of things that first time publishers should consider in a contract. In terms of embargo, I'll just say there's, uh, there's no one answer that you'll get from presses. I think different presses do um, take a different approach and I might be unfair <laughs> in my characterization here, but there are some presses, uh, particularly commercial presses that are trying to publish content um, and are trying to just like publish thousands of books or, you know, and um, I, I have a sense that there is less development and that they take a different approach to this embargo, pro embargo um, situation. But for us, the dissertation is not the book. You know, it, there's so much that happens to transform what was not yet quite a fully baked idea into something that's cohesive and it's gonna make an argument that we tend not to worry about, um, about embargoing the dissertation because the book is gonna be completely different. Yeah, I've never asked whether the dissertation was available or not. It's just a very different thing. And my main message is to librarians to remember it's a different thing that if they have the dissertation on file, they don't actually have the book. Thank you. Um, another question uh, is about sort of the timeline in terms of 
when a book comes in, how long reviews take, that sort of thing. You know, that's almost impossible to generalize, but still. <laughs> Do you want to talk from your experience? Uh, <laughs> well, I can, although I think I've started to block it off of, uh, of my memory. But yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I, in some ways, I feel like it's a, a, a waste of a, our, our time together. But I would say that um, just literally from the time I finished my dissertation to when I thought I had something that was a book took probably about um, four years, actually. And there were the, the chapter I thought was the most important in my uh, dissertation is nowhere to be found, like not a single sentence. From it, in fact, wow. um, but uh, one of the things that was really great, I, I um, had a conversation with Ken early on in my um, process of trying to work from dissertation to book um, in which uh, he said something that shaped the book, even though I wound up publishing it with um, a different press, which was that he was interested in media in as sort of the through line that was coming up in each of the chapters of, um, of what I thought at that point was a book. And that conversation um, was also a gift. And that's another reason I would say talk to editors early on is because it got me thinking in a much more flexible way about the questions that would kind of pull out of what um, the, the, the field I thought it was talking uh, to were. Um, and then uh, the, the reviews, um, they kind of varied in terms of how quickly they came back because I did send it to more than one press. And maybe that's another good question to, to ask you guys. Um, uh, they, they came in basically about three to six months um, from the, the time I first contacted the presses. Um, and that you know also builds in some time about when uh, folks decided they wanted to see more. Um, and then there was time for the revisions and the book really changed a lot again. Um, during that revision process. So everything that Hisela was saying about how much the review process is a gift to what will become uh, your book is, is so true. Um, and so it was ultimately, I think, um, and I, I can't remember exactly, but I think about a year and a half or so um, uh, till the book itself came out, but yeah. Could you guys talk to the, the um, multiple submissions question? I was just going to say first that I think that if people take away anything from this whole day, if they take away the four years and the most important chapter isn't in the book, that's like <laughs> the biggest gift. Because I think that's way more common than anyone expects when they're starting out on the journey. Because it seems like, you know, it's like seeing the tall building and thinking it's close and it's actually like very far away. Um, uh, we're, I'm almost always, I'm kind of against uh, single submissions. Uh, this is another place that Sal and I have slightly different practice. I feel like it's a little coercive because um, the presses that will say, I'll only look at your manuscript if I can see it exclusively, that doesn't bind them at all, but it binds the author. And uh, that seems kind of not, not exactly fair. Um, it's as, as a whole, book publishing is very different than journal article publishing. Almost uniformly, if you, uh, pub if you send out your journal article to more than one journal, you could even lose an acceptance. It's very exclusively based. Uh, with book publishing, the presumption is you might be sending it to more than one press. Um, but it's not necessarily a great idea. If you have an editor you want to work with and they're enthused about it, usually you can count on them to walk you through the process in a, in a kind of good way. You don't need a safety school. Um, some presses will also just opt out of it. And it's like, okay, if you want it to come from our press, then we have to look at it exclusively. And then you can decide whether that is a trade-off you like or not. Ms. Hella, did you have other thoughts? Yeah, I would just say that I've had some situations that maybe can ser serve as caution. I had one, one particular situation where an author uh, submitted to us as their first choice press, and I think she submitted to a bunch of presses. And, and you know, we, and one of her 
um, one of the presses that she was not quite as interested in was really eager to move quickly and move forward fast. And I, and I saw the project and I was like, ah, oh, you're 150,000 words. It's way too long. I don't think your argument is quite as, you know, is quite as developed. So I had concerns about the project. She was pushing me to move quickly because this other press wanted to move quickly. And so I was like, it, you know, sounds like you should go with the other press. And then there was a really, and then she was like, no, 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 but I really want. So, you know, you, I think you have to be careful uh, about submitting to multiple presses when you're not, when they're, they're not um, the same, you don't have the same level of excitement for all of them. Um, so I definitely, you know, I don't think you, sh you should submit for, to, for example, to more than two or three. Um, and then Sylvia was asking as well, um, uh, good practice would be to tell the editors if you are submitting it um, elsewhere rather than keep it quiet. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it is a good practice. It's not so rare that it's going to be, you know, really something that would turn us off. And it's really, it's much better to do that than to then have a surprise and you know, once we get the reports back, have this awkward conversation. Well, oh, so I kind of submitted it to this other place. So, you know, being up front is totally fine. If a press has that, um, Ken was talking about some presses have an exclusive policy where you can only submit to them. That's going to be on their website. You're going to know that from the start. So, you know, it's better to just go ahead and, and be honest. You know, it, this is a relationship you're trying to develop with an editor. You're going to be in relationship with each other for a while. I, I try, you know, I try to be as transparent as honest with authors. And it's great when that happens on the other way. And it's actually helpful for the editors in explaining what the difference between your choices might be. So the difference between us and California would be different than the difference between us and Cambridge. So if I were trying to convince you, I'd want to know what the other places were so I could talk about like why you belonged at Duke rather than one of the other places. And so if that's part of the reason for multiply submitting is to like understand what the options are, then that helps the editor uh, give, you, give you that back. Um, there's another question in terms, and, and I think this might be a little different from the dissertation question, um, but um, uh, in terms of how much can be already out there in articles uh, in relation to the, the book as a whole. Ken, do you want to start on that? Uh, sure. So um, if you're just starting out your career, nobody's going to know who you are if you haven't published some articles. So it's uh, a necessary thing to do. It's good to be a little strategic about that and think of it as just like your Twitter persona, a way of building like your audience. So if you have like an interdisciplinary project to choose a couple of different journals where different parts of the audience will see your work. Uh, it's uh, obviously a great thing to do is like CC's best chapter, you know, send that to a journal so that that could be out there because it's not going to be in the book. That's a really good use of chapters that turn out to be like mm, one too many for the book or not really needed for the book. Um, but also, you know, it's a different genre of itself, the journal article. So what an article for American literature or American quarter needs to look like versus what a book chapter needs to look like is going to be pretty different. So I think, you know, rather than thinking of it as in the kind of the dissertation is the book model where like chapter two is chapter two in the dissertation, it's chapter two when it appears as a journal article, then it's chapter two as a book, and it's just the same thing all across. Think about what these, the works are doing and how they're molded differently. So I think most presses will be very happy to have things where you say, oh, an earlier version of chapter two appeared as blah, blah, blah in American Quarterly or in this edited collection. Very few places will want, uh, and this has actually changed over time with electronic availability. Very few places will want the exact chapter two to actually be owned by Taylor and Francis and off from uh, one of their journals. 
Thanks, Ken. Um, there are a number of questions that are um, related to the, the idea of interdisciplinarity. Um, one of the ways that was phrased was um, how work that is dis interdisciplinary in focus can still be marketed for library and information science, for example. So things that are broad in terms of then going to a smaller um, uh, field, but I think also <laughs> information sci science probably is exceptional in terms of not really small in any way, shape or form. But, um, and then how, how to think about audience, how a press has to um, work among multiple disciplines. Cause I do think that's one of the things Duke does really well but isn't intuitive for authors at the beginning of this process. Yeah, and I'd say that is one of the things that um, we've we've really developed. You know, Ken uh, and I would I would really say that Ken has a lot to do with the way that um, we've the shape that the list has taken and in the interdisciplinary form. Um, but that is one of the, the things we look for. We really um, do specialize in these kinds of books. We uh, acquire a lot of books in departments that are interdisciplinary, women's studies, American studies. And, um, and I think there, there are other presses that also ha have that approach and um, have found ways to, to really market those books uh, and create their own audience. But I'll, I'll let Ken say more. Well, I, I think the, the least part of the struggle is getting people in the core subfield to buy the books. You know, so if I'm flashed on a book we did a, a, probably a decade ago by Brian Larkin called Signal and Noise, which helped introduce the idea of infrastructure, is at Barnard. And it's about Northern Niger. So people, libraries who are collecting things on Northern Niger, that's going to be one of the main books of the year. The real trick was when Lisa Parks at Santa Barbara in media and communications suddenly st stumbled on the book and thought, wow, this would be really helpful in the way we're thinking about cinema studies and media studies at a distance that was probably very, very far from anything that Brian or we had imagined. And Part of that comes in marketing and part of the structure of the press. So at some presses, the uh, editors are very siloed. The person is just looks at sociology. Somebody else just looks at religion, or maybe they look at religion and anthropology. Um, we tend to all have broad um, areas that overlap someone. And also when we market the books, then we think kind of, where could this possibly catch on? So our religion list proper is not the biggest. It's, it's fairly moderate in size, but we often send queer theory or black studies or Latinx studies to religion because we think there'll be people at that meeting who will be interested. So if you think about audience, and this goes back, Cece, to my bookstore thing. If you think about who might walk in and go, oh, this looks interesting. Maybe I could use this for my work that doesn't follow the algorithms of discipline or even of Amazon. It's really like, what are you interested in and how might we reach you? And that's one reason I love the Twitter network way of reaching people is because it's like the word of mouth that kind of finds that thing that could like, so somebody will go, oh, wow, that does sound good. I could be interested in that. So if that's the way you're thinking of your work, then you need a press that thinks of it that way. If you're like, mm -mm, this is really just for people working on Northern Niger, then you actually have a, a wider range of presses you could, you could go to. And that should be something when you talk to an editor that should come out like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a couple of people asked um, versions of this question. How do you decide when your manuscript is ready to send out? I think this goes back to the don't do it alone. <laughs> this is, a, you know, gather your team. I don't think you necessarily will know alone. Um, so, you know, I think we've talked throughout this time about key conversations. There's key conversations with, with an acquisitions editor, with mentors, but you want to have a wide range of people that you're having conversations with about your book. And, 
that's how you're going to develop. Oh, okay. I know what I'm trying to do here. I know the story I'm trying to tell. And once you, you know, I, I think you should have, you should have multiple readers at different stages who are your friends, who are your colleagues and mentors. Um, you know, you don't want to just be re revising kind of on your own. Um, some people have manuscript workshops, which I think ca can be extremely helpful where they bring in a few scholars um, to really go through a manuscript when it's already been revised, but maybe it's still not quite ready for, for formal peer review. Um, so I would say that um, making sure that you have a lot of feedback and have people who are reading your work along the way is, is a really good idea. Um, and I'll just say that uh, with book manuscript workshops, uh, that's something that you can um, advocate for in negotiating your first contract um, in a job, job, ugh, job contract. So it sort of falls in that um, body of things like uh, research funds or computers and things that it's easier to get a dean to say yes to than a salary bump because it's a one-off um, payment for them, but it's a investment in your whole career for you. So I really um, encourage asking about that if it's not something that's regularly done at your institution. Um, and then there are also um, uh, things like the First Book Institute um, that does a kind of, um, uh, uh, that you can apply to from any school, for example. Um, another question, um, what, it, to what extent, and maybe, well, yeah, the question is about social media. Um, it doesn't matter that you have a presence and it, at what point does it matter perhaps? So um, I've certainly found people. I knew I'd be interested in their work because of their social media presence and way of being in the world. And lots of people who put work in, Part of something we haven't talked about is follow through after your book is published and how mm -hmm. important it is to get out and be visible, give readings, give talks, go to conferences when we can do that again. And social media is, makes a lot of that follow through possible and easy, but I wouldn't not publish something I thought was great if the person was not on any social media. I'm sure lots of our authors aren't on any social media at all. Uh, so it's like one of those things that could be a plus, but isn't a necessity. I, uh, I wanna just echo that and also say that our, there are people within the press that definitely look at that. You know, when we're about to launch a book um, into production and, you know, our marketing folks are really excited because somebody has a, a big presence on social media. So it really does help. And again, it's not for everybody. I really wasn't on Twitter till like a year or two ago. And I know, you know, everyone has different ways of getting their voice out there. Thank you. Um, I just want to note um, uh, for folks that in the chat, there are mentions to some of the Duke specific resources in terms of workshopping and that sort of thing. Um, let's see here. Uh, another question, um, uh, oh, at least another note is that um, librarians can also be really helpful at figuring out what presses make sense. Um, I'm gonna ask if there are things that I've missed uh, that other folks um, see, and there is. Paulo is helping me find a question. That, there were a couple of questions about proposals that get rejected. Do you share the reviewer feedback? with the author, even if you don't accept it? And is it, what is the number one mistake that scholars who submit proposals um, that lead to rejection seem to make? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, I could start. The, I think the number one mistake is taking it personally. Um, often the reason for rejection actually has nothing to do with the quality of your work. We publish 150 books a year, which is, a lot for us. Um, Cambridge or Oxford publish 4,000 books a year, Routledge publish 4,000 books a year. But that means we're turning down about 90% of what we get. So lots of things I look at and go, I could publish this and no one would go, what's happened to Duke? Why are they publishing this? Um, 
there'd be really great things to publish, but I have to choose like, what are the projects I'm supporting now? What is my time like? You have actual people with finite time. So a lot of the, a lot of the times things that we turn away, it's just at this moment, we can't take something else on, or this isn't kind of the direction, this is a direction our list has been, and we think we're happy with the contribution it made, but now we're looking more in this direction. So to not take that as a kind of personal, I have to get myself off the floor, which nobody likes rejection, but to really kind of persevere and find the place where there is space for it, where somebody will be excited about it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there, it, we just get so many proposals um, and there's just no way. And, and, and we, I know we all try to give some feedback where we can, but given the, the volume, it's really hard. I would say one of the other mistakes is that people really do send things to us that don't fit our list at all. You know, um, we don't do military history. We don't do biographies of president. Like there's just certain things that we, we just, we don't do. We tend to really um, favor decolonial approaches, bottom up histories. You know, there's just, some people don't know our press and, um, and, and submit things to us that, that don't really fit. But most of the call happens in house. So I think the number of things that go out to readers and then are, Sometimes they're kind of our version of resubmit, revise and resubmit. But the number of things that are rejected outright after reviews is probably a small fraction of the number of things. They're just like, what if we envision forward a good version of this project? Is this something we can commit to that we have space for? And, and so a lot of the decision is actually in-house. When they're reviews, I almost always share them unless on it's very rare that anything is insulting or hostile but unless it was uh, I would always share that um, I thought I, I might add just one thing about the review process and how to take them often people concentrate on what the advice of the reviewer is and think that's really wrong-headed whereas I think to concentrate on where the reviewer hit a speed bump what threw them off that they come up with this advice. They're usually up late at night trying to finish their reviews, invent something as a possible solution. That solution isn't the kind of standard you have to reach. It's the what made somebody need that solution in the first place. So I think that would be something if you do get reviews that are hard to take, try and read past them and see like, what was it that was getting in the way of the person really hearing what you thought you were saying clearly? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we probably are going to uh, wrap up in about two to three more minutes. Um, I wanted to ask if there was anything that hasn't come up in the questions that either of you um, think is important to share. Um, maybe a little bit about writing. You know, I, and I, I, maybe I'm also speaking to, from my own experience as, um, as someone who, you know, the kind of graduate school kind of takes away your voice in a way and getting that voice back does mean practice and, and developing that as, as something that you do regularly. Um, so I just would encourage people to write, to just try to have that be part of what they do as much as possible every day. And I know there's just so many competing demands, especially for people of color who do so much more mentoring and service work because there's often so few people that can be called upon to do some of that work. And I just, um, I really encourage everyone to just schedule in time to write and time to think. Um, because it's really hard unless you intentionally put that into your schedule. Oh, that's really true. And I would just add to like, this is really the time. This is your time. This is the time that um, black voices, indigenous voices, people of color in general are really needed. And that's both in terms of other epistemologies, other forms of writing, other ways of seeing things 
that have been seen for a long time. And I think people are going to look back at this time as a real renaissance, the way people look at the 20s and see the variety of things that have been done and the different kinds of forms that were invented. And, you know, you can be there, just show up and like take it seriously and do the work. And it's, it's a really, it's a beautiful moment. So I, I encourage you. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, this has been a really rare opportunity and um, we appreciate your, um, your thoughts and your time and, and the work that you've done for these fields as well. Um, I also wanna thank all of our uh, co-sponsors and organizers. Um, there uh, will be, um, each of the, the resources that have been mentioned are also appearing in the chat and I believe they will be um, available in the, the recording in some way, shape or form. <laughs> um, and in any case, we thank all of you for coming and we wish you the best. And um, the work that you're doing, I just echo what Ken says, is it's needed, it's the time for it and it's a good time to be among this company of, of um, scholars together. So go well and thank you. Mm -hmm.